and what has gone on in their marriage, um, I believe is going to be a deep, deep encouragement to you. And he's just written a, a book called Never Fails in the last year or two. Uh, it's a 30-day devotional. Uh, for marriage, but it's good uh, whether you are single, married, good marriage, bad marriage, this is key. And uh, so it's a huge blessing to have him here. Would you give a warm heights welcome to Brian and Tracy Sumner? So good. How are you? Good. Thank you guys so much. I'm so thankful that, that you're, you're both here. <laughs> And it's not just you, Brian, because you were with us a couple of years ago. Um, but Tracy, to have you here too is such a huge blessing. We know you're the better half, and so uh, that is that is good. Um, and then there's a surprise. If you weren't here with us a couple months ago, as soon as Brian starts talking, you'll know there's a little extra little surprise in who Brian is. He's not just a skater. Um, he's not American. I'm not from Prescott either. Yeah. And... I have to say this every time, because actually I just like telling you guys the truth, but I am not the one speaking with an accent. How many, anyone in here English? Well, only me and the people who are English will not be speaking with an accent, because you are a bunch of Americans trying to speak English. Amen. So, if you, Can you just give us just a couple of minutes on your backstory, both um, individually and, and then as, as a couple? You know, I, I guess I've been going around the world sharing my intense story for years, and it's more about how everything I gained didn't really matter in the eyes of who the Lord is and what life's about. Today, for you, it's as simple as, you know, I was raised in Liverpool, England, home of the Beatles, and I sounded a lot different then, looked a lot different, acted a lot different, didn't know Jesus, didn't want to know, would have thought you were all crazy, worshiping an invisible God, you know, talking about the Bible. I was raised playing this sport where you take a ball and you kick it with your foot. It's obviously called football. Amen. The English people said, the truth sets you free. I'll continue preaching that to my grave. Um, at 13 years of age, I watched a movie called Police Academy 4 with Mahoney and Hightower. That's a life changer. That was a life changer. But in that movie, the fourth episode was skateboarding. I seen those tricks, said, this is real, can you really do this? Started skating a few months later, and that was my life. You know, within two years, skating wasn't that big, so I was in magazines and videos. I got invited to America at 15, 16 to ride for Tony Hawk's companies, and really, I had this super successful career, never having a job, I mean, making, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a month in an apartment with a bunch of guys, when all you do is skate, eat Taco Bell, and sit in the jacuzzi. <laughs> That was my life, but what more do you want? I mean, it still sounds pretty good right now, right? Even though we're healthier. But then you begin to make a lot of money. Skating blew up, you know, sometimes, I mean, two or $300,000 a year. So, so what are you going to tell me I need? You know, and it wasn't a pride thing. I just loved America. I loved, you know, the smooth ground, the photographers, the filmers. I loved skateboarding, and it was my passion. And so it provided a lot, but I was still, you know, gaining the whole world, losing my soul kind of life. And then... I joke and say I fell in love with skating at 19, and then I didn't know why I was in America. I loved to skate, but right around the age of you know, 19, I fell in love again. Obviously not with God, or our story wouldn't be as powerful, but I met a girl who I'd known a couple of years on and off, but at 19, things really shifted gears, and she did drive on the wrong side of the road. She still does, and, you know, speaks with an accent and even would call football soccer, but that's where enter Tracy, you know, the, the better half, so. <laughs> okay, so I grew up in Huntington Beach, California. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, sorry, well, we love Prescott. <laughs> we do. Honestly, they did not know that there was anything that was green in the whole of Arizona. No. So as we came around those hills, that my family just loves this place. Yeah. yeah. They keep asking where the ocean is, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I grew up in Huntington Beach, and um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, I was introduced to church just in the Catholic church through my grandparents. Um, I met Brian when he was 15 years old, and... Um, at the time, I'm two years older than him, so when I met him, you know, he still, he had this little blonde bowl haircut, and he... <laughs> there, there you go. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> because you I look mean, like I you're know, 11. I know. I look is like that... I'm a monk. I know. <laughs> that wasn't even... That, <laughs> that is actually when we start... That, that's not that, yeah. 
That's a bit crazy. But <laughs> you guys are stalkers. I mean, I don't know what's going on in this church. No. Yeah. <laughs> Go- Google is a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. But I looked crazier than that when she met me. Yeah. No, he had braces and blonde bowl haircut. And so my friends had been trying to set me up with him. And um, I just remember saying uh, that he looked like he was 10. So I was like, no, <laughs> that's not a possibility. And um, as I said, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And the mentality in my family was that it's important that you live with someone before you get married because um, how are you supposed to know if you're compatible or not? So I just look back on that and just like, I, you know, as we raise kids and I just can't believe that my parents thought that. Mm-hmm. But um, so I have that relationship that ends up not working out. I come back to Huntington Beach where I'm reconnected with Brian through the same friends. Um, it's a few years later. The bowl haircut's gone. <laughs> I'm bringing it back. Yeah. <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> the braces are gone. And I, he just, he's unrecognizable. <laughs> so I was a different human being, apparently. So yeah. the person I had first met. So anyway, I had asked, who's that? And my friends were like, that's Brian. And so anyway, that night that we reconnected, we were just... We couldn't. We talked all night. We were basically inseparable from that reconnection. And mm. then I just remember, like, from that point, things got, like, extremely serious, like, really fast. Yeah, and at the time, I mean, you know, I was coming over to America. I'd be there for three months, go back for a few, be there for six months, go back. And so I'd seen Tracy. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, we had no idea of even being, you know, she's part Italian, part Mexican, and having this kind of Catholic faith. We didn't know of the love of God. We didn't understand it. And I guess at best what was about to happen for us was the world's love was about to shape us because we did love each other. I mean, we fell madly in love, you know, just inseparable. And I guess that really says, you know, I love the way she looked, love the way she made me feel, loved all the things she did for me. So I was actually just loving myself. That's, that's the best way we can look at the world's love. And same for her. Wow, this guy, you know, he's always pursuing me and after me. And her friends would say, I just want a guy that pursues me like that. I mean, it was the, the best case scenario. And so why wouldn't you believe, you know, kind of the Hollywood lie that after only being together for four months, this was definitely going to work, right? So I was about to go back to England, which was not going to happen because I'm thinking I'm not going to be away from this woman. There's no way. Let's go down to the beach tonight. I'd purchase the ring. Let's stand on, you know, the tower, Tower 8, still where we live today. And hey, if she's crazy enough, do you want to marry me? And obviously she's crazy enough because she drove out to Vegas the next day on the wrong side of the road. We got married in the little white chapel. You know, we go into this church where, I mean, there's a pastor we've never met, a witness we've never seen. They read 1 Corinthians 13 and 4, and we're emotional, we're crying, we're just like, this is awesome, I have no clue about God. I mean, getting married in Vegas after four months, is there anyone here that's ever done that? <laughs> four months? All right. So we got married, and there's money in the bank, life's all about us. Hey, let's go ahead and have a child. Now we're pregnant, you know, the whale's at our feet, but we've never, <clears throat> ever really heard the gospel to know about God, so enter this change, the emotions, the hormones, all that takes place in pregnancy, and we end up in a very different world quickly. Oh, yeah. 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 And so um, we get pregnant, and then we have a baby, and now my focus begins to shift to the baby, and... um, you know, every, he has colic, and so I'm constantly, I'm on the baby schedule. I'm now sleeping when the baby's sleeping. And um, so as I, my body's changing and I'm just focusing on baby, he is no longer getting the tension that he was getting. And so that's when things really shifted in our relationship. Um, okay, we have this little baby boy I now have to take care of, where he's still in the prime of his skateboarding, traveling, and you know, doing the whole Tony Hawk thing. I'm pursuing hair as well, needing all this attention. Yeah, and she's becoming a attention. mom. Yeah. And so at that moment, we, we start to fight. And that's, um, and that's when the reality hit. Because he was someone that I remember thinking, I never fight with him. Like from my past relationship to when I met him, I was just like, we were just so compatible. And everything was so amazing. And then when we start fighting... I'm just like, no, like, I just didn't think this was We're possible. We're mad at that and then mad at each and other. There's no um, biblical, like, standpoint, like, for my family or him, like, saying, you guys can fight for this. You know, we have people telling us, yeah, you guys, while the baby's young, get out of this now, while, before you ruin the kid's life. And mm-hmm. so 
we're thinking at this point, okay, maybe we're not right for each other. And that's when, um, you know, sadly. Her family saying, wrong. get out of this. My family saying, get out of this. And, and, you know, even just to speak into that, the last few services, we even at 50 year old people, you know, that's still young, but they're telling us, wow, I remember when my wife got pregnant, the changes. And women, you know this, the second you get pregnant, you're a mom. Amen? But for a man, men, you don't really feel like a dad until the baby shows up, right? So think, I mean, it's true, but think about that truth. So she's becoming a mom, her body's changing, you know, your feet grow, your hair's doing stuff, you're sleeping a lot. And there's the man, seriously, women, you know, you remember those days, right? And there's the man going like, where's the girl I'm courting? Where's the girl I'm dating? Where's the person I'm in love with? And we don't, yeah, we start to put our hand there on the belly and we feel it, but we don't switch gears. And to young couples, this is so important. I mean, anyone, I mean, how many of you guys have been married for a long time, right? You just know two years in, this is crazy, five years in, it's crazy, ten years, and you begin to see this pattern of you realize who you are. We'd never thought about that. And the advice we're getting is bail. You know, this is where we were, so we begin to fight. I mean, we begin to get frustrated and angry, and we're saying all these different things. And within, you know, two years of saying, well, maybe you're not the right person, maybe that other girl, that other guy, that's the soulmate, that's the thing we're looking for. It's not really yours, it's you. After saying we're going to get divorced for so long, you know, as a guy that... I can go out and work on a trick until I make it or leave it. It doesn't make a difference, really. Marriage now is failing. Wait, I'm not going to stay in this. She's not going to stay in this. And so there we are with a beautiful baby boy, divorced. And to make it more personal for me, it's the first time in my life you'd say I really failed at something. Not like I'm great and all this, but I never really pursued anything aside from skating. And that worked out. America worked out. This wife worked out. And a child. And now I'm divorced. And I remember saying, God, whoever you are, you know, Allah, Buddha. I mean, literally, might as well have been the spaghetti monster. Because in England, <laughs> if you guys know a lot of English people, you're not raised thinking about Jesus. You think about Sasquatch and UFOs and God. It's all in the same category. You're like, I don't know if God's real. I don't know if Sasquatch is real. Like, it doesn't matter. But now I begin to challenge God. You know, I look at all these different religions. For lack of time, we can't go there. But picture a guy who doesn't want to live opening up the Bible to Genesis 1, and right there it says, let us make man in our image. If you don't know why you're special, your dog and your cat, as much as you love them, you know, the tarantula we just seen on the side of the road yesterday, giant scary spider, I don't know why you guys live here, it's crazy. <laughs> Amen? Those things aren't made in the image of God. I am. And so my next obvious question was, well, God, you made me. Why does my life suck? Why am I divorced? Why am I angry? You know, I had all the questions, what about cancer, what about this with children, isn't the church crazy and goofy? And of course, God tells us, well, yeah, Brian, I made you, but your grandparents, Adam and Eve, I put them in the garden, gave them all that they wanted, just don't eat this one thing, because when you do, I'm not going to kill you, you will surely die, amen? And so they all run over there with their iPhones, take photos with the tree, <laughs> eat of the tree, you know, it's all about the tree and the sin, and we still have that nature, our sin nature is still there. Okay, God, you're saying I'm made in your image. Life's crazy because we live in a cursed world. Yes. Well, if you're so good, what are you going to do? And right there we see it in Genesis 3. One of the skateboards even has the image of Jesus crushing Satan's head. God from the beginning telling us he's going to send someone to deliver and redeem us. Amen? But at the time, like I said, we were vegans. So picture reading the Bible, hearing about Israel, where God does some very scary and offensive stuff to a vegan. Every year, because you guys are bad, it's not your fault. Take the innocent little lamb that has done nothing to anyone and slaughter it. This sounds pretty crazy to me. And take the goat who's done nothing to anyone, lay your hands on it, and go put it outside the city. I mean, that sounds cruel to me. Then, you know, you're all dead in sin. I'm going to save Israel. Shed the lamb's blood over the door. None of this was making sense. I was still trying to disprove everything. Finally, you get to the New Testament and... John the Baptist's cousin comes walking down the Jordan. Behold the Lamb of God. He's the goat who died outside the city, the scapegoat in our place. Amen. I mean, you begin to see the picture of that blood that was applied over the doorpost, all of my lie and lust and anger and frustration. And finally, as I'm seeing the gospel unfold, wow, God, you went to the cross for me and for Tracy and for everyone else. So ultimately, the story became I sat on my knees one night, I'd bought a home. I'd said to my ex-wife at the time, who was Tracy, let's just try and be around each other at least. You know, let's try and make this work. Because in my heart, I thought, 
As long as I'm around till my son's five, he'll know his dad loves him and cares, but I still didn't want to be around. I was still angry. And ultimately, sitting on my knees at night, I was going to God to fix me, which means just make me have happy thoughts and a nice life and take me out of this cursed world. But God was obviously revealing to me there's an issue of sin. You've sinned. That's the gospel. Sin is the bad news. The cross is the good news. And that night on my face, I said, God, I need to be forgiven. I give you my life, my skating. I'll go wherever you want. I'll get baptized. And Lord, if you want us to, I'll even remarry that woman. And so ultimately for me, Jesus Christ showed up in a radical way, a scientific way. Listen, faith is only subjective to other people. But to you, if you know the Lord, you know the Lord. He showed up as I repented, saved me, washed me, redeemed me. And I sat there laughing and crying, saying, I can't believe this is real. Went and laid in bed next to my now four or five-year-old son. My ex-wife, who's sitting there, sits up like a zombie and gives this speech about almost everything I just prayed. And I'm going to sleep going, you just confirmed it in that room. And now you're confirming it here. Ultimately, to wake up the next day to my basically Catholic-thinking wife, who was still divorced, and she has this mindset like, I don't even remember sitting up that night, so. Yeah. And which is no, crazy. I don't remember, but, mm -hmm. but I'm glad God used me to confirm those things. Mm -hmm. I remember Brian that day, uh, or the next day, this change. Like, he had done the anger management, like he said, and the, like he was given the steps to take of how to control his anger. But this was a change that was so it was just one of those things that was just instantaneous like overnight this 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 like peace that was on him his demeanor his faith everything about him had changed so much and so i just remember him praying all the time and reading and going to church and he was trying to get me and my son at this time to go to church and um i just remember you know, I just wasn't there yet. God was still kind of doing a work in me. And I was just like, okay, no, I'm, you know. I don't is, need that. I That's don't need for you. that. You know, I was raised where I was thinking, you know, in the mindset of like, if you're a good person, you go to heaven, you know. <laughs> Only Hitler goes Only to Hitler hell, basically. And, like, and her family probably thought Anne Bryan would be there too. <laughs> but she was just thinking, hey, like this is great for him, but it began to minister where she's yeah, like, something's it, happened. Well, I, you know, when you see this change, you're just like, okay, then maybe this is real. Like this is what we needed. And so um, I end up going to church on one of the days that, you know, typical people who don't typically go to church, I mean, it was like Easter or Christmas or something. I was like, okay, I'll go with you. And so um, I remember on the screen, uh, they were playing the song, I Can Only Imagine. And I was reading the lyrics about like standing before God and what it would be like. And um, I just remember like this feeling coming over me, like just this warmth in my heart. And I began to cry a little and I was just like, what is this feeling? And I was like, is this what Brian's been feeling? And so I had been praying about it, uh, like God would show me like what, what was going on with him. Like I wanted to experience that. And so um, I went to church again, and we had a guest speaker, and um, God just really used that guest speaker to um, like call me out of my seat after an altar call had been given. That and he I was, spoke on sin. So she, yeah, he spoke on sin. Message, it was just yeah. a message that really made me realize how much I was in need of a savior. Mm. And, um, and so, yeah, he used that pastor that, that day to call me out of my seat when an altar call had already been given and I was too scared to stand up to um, lead me to Christ that day. So, Amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> to, to get this straight then, uh, you, neither of you know Jesus and you don't know each other. Um, you fall in love, reality sets in, everything goes south, um, you get divorced, Jesus rescues you both and rescues your marriage, you get remarried. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's amazing. It's great. I mean, that's huge. And that, that really is such a, a powerful reminder that where... Where you find Jesus, you find hope. Where you find Jesus, you find healing. Where you find mm -hmm. Jesus, you find reconciliation um, between us and him, and then even relationally speaking. Mm -hmm. And so praise God for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but now, Brian, 10, 12 minutes. I want to cut you loose I, because... 10, 12 minutes? I know, I know. <laughs> it's like we need 35. I know. No. Well, Holy Spirit guys will empower are you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what... what 
what I'm interested in hearing is both knowing you now and and what God's done in you and your heart for the Lord and for the, the word. Mm. Um, as, as you went to the word, uh, in regard to yourself and each other and marriage, um, how did you begin to see life in context of, mm-hmm. of marriage, Christ and, and his word and, and, and your marriage? Well, you know, and the other thing to say too is, you know, our 15 year old son sitting in a room back there, I mean, God gave us a daughter, Eden Avery, who's a nine year old sitting in the kids class and our other son, Jude Micah, who's six, is sitting here. So as you can see, you know, God did a work. But the thing is, we could have came to faith that weekend, got married, sat up here and said, hey guys, we're remarried. You're like, yeah, this is good. But the reality is, it's also about having that godly marriage. And we all have godly marriages, whether you're in the craziest of sins, struggling, whether you're upside down with your spouse. Godly marriage means you understand God wants to work in it and wants to pastor it. And so for me as a skateboarder, I quit a lot of sponsors. I began to get invited places to travel. I just felt like I didn't hear this for 24 years. I haven't got time to be in Australia for three weeks to film three or four tricks and stay significant in a skate world. I witnessed to all those guys, but I began to share. And then about a few years later, well, probably what, two or three years ago now, I remember waking up one day and just, just, we'd been talking about it a week. Do we really need to focus on marriage ministry? Because we did a I Am Second video. It's a ministry, a, a Billy Graham video. And as these videos would go out, we get so much feedback. And we began to pray, you know, being mid-30s, do you want us to focus on marriage ministry? And that night, as I'm sitting around this guy we'd only known, you know, hung out with him two times, he begins to laugh and says, can I pray for you? And the first thing he says is, just like this, you know, you meant to do marriage ministry, right? And so that was where really this book came out of. And here's the crazy thing. That week, it was like five, six, seven couples texting us, emailing us, messengers. And these are people that were our friends. And the hard part, I guess, but also the blessing is that as we began to sit with these couples, it generally goes like this. I mean, if you were to get this book, this is the heart of it. I'm sitting with someone who says, well, you know, my dad's a pastor. My grandpa's a pastor. We've been in the church. We know all the songs. You know, our kids are Christians, yada, yada, yada. But... We feel like God is leading us out of our marriage. You know, we were in a prayer circle and my friend, and I've heard this about my friends who were very serious Christians. You know, God's released you from your marriage. Well, is it infidelity? Well, no. Can you just show me in the text where you find that? Can you show me in the text where God messed up your marriage and he was wrong? And some of these people would say, well, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, it's one thing to say you're a Christian, but it's another thing to follow Jesus. Because the last time we looked, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, amen? But the verse continues on. And what does it say? And they follow me. I mean, man doesn't live. Do you guys want marriages that are alive or dead? Alive. Man doesn't live but by what? The word of God. It isn't on the bread alone. I mean, even verses that talk about the word is a lamp unto our feet. So here's these couples coming to us thinking the grass is green. And I guarantee there's someone they're checking out, an old friend that hit them up, something in their life that they bought the lie that the greener grass is there. If you follow the greener grass, it's not going to be God's will. God's not going to be in it. And they say, well, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says if you're a follower who God brings together, let what? No one separate. And they'd say, I know that verse. No, no, no. If God brings it together, let no man separate. No, no, we know. Believe me, we were raised in the church. You're not hearing me. Walk with Jesus. And I'm not saying that God hates a person who's been divorced. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says God hates divorce. doesn't mean he hates those who have been divorced, who are struggling with hard times. Amen? You've got to hear that. But what we're saying to you today is God is still the pastor of marriage. God is still the one who pursues couples and loves. And our story just happens to be a story where you see the victory. I mean, how many guys have been married a long time? Would you marry yourself? (laughs) You write that on the wall of your house, that will minister to you for the rest of your life. I mean, we live in a world, you know, and think about it. We talk about Billy Graham's wife. You know, she was asked the question, do you ever think about divorcing Billy? You know what she said? No, but I think about killing him every day. (laughs) I mean, that's Billy Graham's wife. I mean, look at the guy, but think about it. Here's why. Because we call this book Never Fails, obviously, because what never fails will love. But we were going to call this Death by Marriage. I mean, and that's funny, right? But think about it. What is Christianity? 
It is dying to self. It is less of me, more of you. I must decrease, he must increase. Take up your cross. So if God wants to deal with me as a single man before I'm married, how's he going to do it? wants to deal with my wife as a single woman at the time. Well, now we're one. God is going to continually shape us into the image of Jesus, which is what this is all about. Amen? By using our marriage. I mean, the days my wife says, you're crazy. I say, you're way crazier. You married me twice. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. I mean, how many of you guys know we live in a cursed world? We do. You are all going to face difficult times. We live in a world where we think it is going to be perfect, and it's not. Every one of us had an idea about marriage before we got married. It's going to look like this. It's going to be like that. Everything's going to work out. We're going to live here, make this much money, have this many kids, our prayer life, our sex life, our yada, yada, yada. Are you God? Am I God? God has a plan. I'm not saying he wants your marriage to be bad. I'm saying God is at work in you, and he has an obligation, a loving obligation to himself to lead you, direct you, and shape you. As a guy that's angry, how am I going to learn not to be angry? By depending on the Lord. And listen, you guys, women get just as angry as men, or the women don't normally use that language or punch holes and stuff. Instead, sadly, they generally stay quiet, and it stays internal, and then six or seven years down the line, they're off doing something crazy. We live in a world very crazy, so for us, what we realized early on is that our marriage was contractual. Our marriage was something that if Tracy was doing her part, I was going to do my part. I'm saying I love her unconditionally as long as she keeps my conditions. And you might be there in that place today. Contract says, well, if Ron comes over and fixes my garage, I'm going to pay you. If you fix my car, if you do this for me, I'm going to do this for you. But that isn't biblical love. You've probably heard the words for love in the Bible, the Greek words that talk about an erotic kind of love, a friendship kind of love, you know, this family kind of love. But we all know the famous word for love in the Bible, in the Greek, the agape love of God. Amen. Tracy didn't know the agape love of God. Brian didn't know the agape love of God. See, contract is about yourself. You're going to feel like a doormat. I'm not going to give. I've sat with so many couples who say, I'm not willing to be physical anymore because we're not in the place we're meant to be. How does that help your marriage? How does not wanting to pray help your marriage? It's like that car with four wheels on and one part's prayer, one part's passion, one part's sex, one part's this. You start taking these things off that God has called us to do covenantly, amen? The thing is all over the road. We lived in a way where our love was based on what we were going to do, and that's not God's love. Romans 5, 8, you know this. God demonstrates his own agape for us. While we're yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He even tells us a new command I give you. Love. Agape, love one another. I wasn't loving Tracy that way. And as I'm saying this, I'd like to just challenge you guys, even before we get into these texts, but you need to be able to say, here is our church, God leading us, single or not, married or not. Amen. Because even though you're single, you're still going to be married to Jesus. But as we sit here today, I was digging through the text over and over these past few years, and this always speaks to me. Song of songs, especially verse 2 to 7, you've heard it. Do not arouse or awaken what? Love until it so desires. What the author's saying to these two, this young couple who are pursuing each other, do not take your love, Brian, and put it on Tracy until it is a covenant. Do not go there physically. Do not go there spiritually. Do not go there mentally. Because this kind of love, the Ahava, is the love that Jesus Christ has for you. He's seen us all in this room. He's seen all our sin. He said, I'm choosing to put my love on top of them. Covenant gives regardless. Ron is getting paid regardless. My wife is getting loved regardless. But that really isn't how we live. That isn't what we do. America says paint the wall the way you want. Drive the car the way you want. My Starbucks better be hot. Don't cut me off in the road. My marriage better be perfect. Or guess what I'm doing? I'm out. The last time we checked, Jesus came to what? Save. He's the only person that never had to go to the cross and never had to save. Yet he chose to do that. And if Jesus had to die for his own marriage, amen, you and I sure need to learn to die for our marriage. Jesus said, who God brings together, let no man separate. We see in the Gospels there that he's challenged on this verse. And I just want to read it for you. It's in Matthew 19, 3. We'll have it on the screen. But it says, some Pharisees came to test him, Jesus. And they said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Meaning, can we get out of divorce if we want? If she isn't in shape anymore, if she nags me too much, if she's too much involved in this in her life, you know, crocheting or whatever it is. 
Seriously, they're saying for every reason. And look at what Jesus says. I love what he says, verse 4. Haven't you read? Some of you guys, your marriages will change because you need to get back to reading the word of God and walking with the Lord. Amen. He says, hasn't you read that the beginning the creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Meaning Tracy will become Tracy Sumner. We'll wear this ring upon the consummation of marriage. What do we know happens? There's a shedding of blood. This is covenant. He says, from the beginning, this was God's intention. And he says, they are no longer two but one. And this is their response, which is a great response. They said, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Why did Moses allow it? Let me ask you this. Did God allow it? Or did Moses allow it? Why did Moses say this is okay? Because they couldn't handle, they couldn't deal, they wanted out, they were buying the lie of the world, and Jesus gives us the answer. Moses permitted, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because your hearts were what? How many of you guys are Christians? Are your hearts still hard? Or has the old passed away and old things become new? Does Ezekiel 36 tell us that we've been given a new heart, a heart that is flesh, not a heart that is hard? Amen. He says he allowed this because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. And he even goes on to say, if you divorce your wife for any reason, other than infidelity, other than sexual morality, then you are committing adultery. Jesus said this is not the way from the beginning. And I have to say... That for someone that just wanted to divorce their, their wife for out, without this reason, it would only be because their hearts are hard. Jesus said from the beginning, this wasn't the case. Where is Jesus talking about when he says the beginning? Where did everything begin? Genesis. We have this beautiful story. In the beginning, God created the heavens. God created and created and created. And God saw it all. And what do we read? And God saw that it was... Isn't it amazing that everything God made was good and then fall, then there's sin, then there's struggle? Do you know there's only one thing in Genesis that God ever says is bad? I mean, how could God say it was bad if there's never been sin? It says God saw that it was good. In Genesis 2 and 18, he says this though. It is not good that man is alone. But is he alone? He's hanging out with God. I mean, how less alone can you feel? Everything God says to you is godly advice. Everything God speaks to you is life. Amen. Yet God knew that even Adam being born without sin, living in that perfect place with God, he was still alone, even with God, even with the animals, without something or rather someone. What's her name? Woman. Eve. God's design all along, and it gets a bit crazy next. It says God brought all these animals to Adam and said, hey, are one of these, you know, one of these suitable to be your helper? And we all said, amen, no, thank God. I mean, here's the giraffe, you know, here's the goat, here's the pig and the snake. And maybe you say, man, my my spouse kind of seems like some of those things once in a while. Amen, but that's not how God views it. God shows up and he brings how many women to Adam? Men, how many women do you need? You should write that down. You need one. You need one. He brought one woman to Adam. And where did he take her from? The rib, which in the Hebrew means cell structure. She came out from his rib and back to his rib she returns as she's sitting in his covering. Amen. He brought one woman. And notice what he did to Adam. He put Adam into a trance, which means, men, get out of the way. Stop chasing every woman, looking for this godly wife. You need to make yourself as godly as you can, walking with Jesus. And when you're out of the way, God's going to bring her to you, and that will be who she is. Amen? I have to say when I make this point that women, do you really get who you are? Because I think one of the biggest lies the enemy has brought is he's told you, and he's ministered to you, and he's programming you, just like he did in the garden, that you're meant to be someone you're not. If every person on the planet was praying and fasting for me, there is no one greater in all of creation, all the prophets, to pray for me than who? My wife. God thinks she is the suitable helper. God thinks she is the one that's closest to my heart, that can intercede and love and pursue me best. Can you imagine if the world presented this idea? Imagine the Oprah show. God's mystique for a woman. Imagine the covers of Cosmopolitan, how to be a godly wife. Instead, it's about sex and choosing yourself, how to be in shape and parade yourselves and all these things that don't matter. 
Women, as a, as, a, as a man that has a daughter who's nine, my goal for her is, do you know that beauty is fleeting and charm is deceptive? Do you know that you are made for one man and you have a gift that can be a blessing, exposing godliness and love to the world by loving him? My wife is the object of beauty for me. If she puts on loads of weight, if her hair falls out, if my teeth fall out, as my stomach begins to sag more and more, amen? We are the object of beauty for one another. This makes everything easy. God put men in a trance, brought one woman. It's not all out there. And this, see how much of this is faith? This is me saying, is this really the one for me? God says so. Is God here? Shall we separate? Even if crazy things had happened, God's intention is still for us to be forgiving and pursue and love each other. We've got to get this. Not only into our hearts, but in our spirit and definitely into our skulls. Amen? Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan is the God of this world. And I'll give you an example of how this works. I talk to so many men today and their wives get to 35. They become obsessed with the gym. Everything aligns about their body. And before you know it, they are running around in bed with all kinds of different men. My mom used to say, men expose women. They objectify women. But can I tell you today, especially, it's women objectifying themselves now. This is going to sound really silly to some of you, but it makes sense. Think about the Twilight series years ago. Amen? Maybe you've never seen it. Hopefully not. I haven't. But the whole gist of it is these guys running around with their tops off, and these older women would sit and watch these movies and basically lusting after these men. Then this whole term, you know, being this cougar, it sounds offensive, but these older women that pursue these younger men... Even the commercials I see in California today, an older woman goes into a bar with 10 younger men and she says, let me buy you a drink. This is just an attack on the family. This is just a sermon like in the garden. Did God really say? Yes, he said. It is written. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that to say Adam was in a trance. God brought one woman. Man wakes up and it sounds cheesy, but he looks at Eve and he says, whoa, man. Amen. <laughs> and then he begins to write a poem. Maybe it's a rap, but he says this. It says in Genesis 2, 23. You should rap it. I'm not going to rap it. Yeah. <laughs> this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why they are united. They become one flesh. And look, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. They were both naked and they felt no shame. Then came the curse. They tried to cover themselves with the flesh of animals. As God said, where are you? And ultimately, it's Jesus Christ's blood that applied to our lives, that covers us. Amen. But if you want to see the state of the world today, just consider that most people want to be as naked as they can, and there's no shame. Even after the fall, they want to expose themselves and live a life. And listen, in your marriage... The grass is green as going to be pitched to you the rest of your days. You've got to guard your eyes, guard your ears, guard your heart. I'm aware I could flirt with anyone. Anyone could flirt with me. All those people from my past, you know, that I was in school with or the future, my wife the same. This is someone that attacks the marriage and you've got to build a wall. And a song of song says, keep the foxes out. Amen. The whole of the Bible is the story of marriage. That's it. Like I said, Jesus coming to slay a dragon to redeem his bride, to consummate marriage at the end of time. And I'll say this with a couple of closing thoughts, but in Ephesians, the Bible tells us that a man leaves his father and mo mother and becomes one with his wife. This is what refers to Christ and the church. This is a picture. Our issue isn't with marriage, you guys. Our issues are with God. It's with understanding God's plan. If my marriage is about me getting more and more, I'm going to be about building houses, having cars, looking the part, being the flashy preacher, and I couldn't care less. Skating gave me a bunch of stuff that is never going to satisfy me. Today, the more godly my wife is, the less I have to worry about. The more prayer we're going to you know, be sitting in, the more we're going to use our resources for the kingdom. The Great Commission is the centerfold to holding your marriage together as you trust in the Lord. And here's just two thoughts. Of those couples I sat with, they said, how can I pursue my spouse and love them? I remember praying, Lord, what should I tell them? And there was just a simple thought. For seven days right now, I want you to focus on God. God's on top, then your spouse, then your family, then the rest of the world. Imagine Jesus is coming back in seven days. How has God called you to live every day? These are the verses I gave, First Peter 3, 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. 
Live with her in an understanding way, whether she's in church or not. She wants a divorce or not. She's frustrated or not. Live with her, love her, believe God is doing a work. That is all you can do. And choose Jesus Christ over her every day. That is what witness to my wife. Amen. I didn't want to fight. If you want the house and the car, I was pursuing Jesus. And as soon as she goes, oh, I can't interact with this. What is going on with him? That is the witness. How many wives I've heard say they want their husbands to come to faith, and when the guy does, they bounce and run out and do crazy things, because I believe they just wanted to control him, even as Genesis says in the case, amen? Your hearts will be to have rule, your desires will be to have rule over your husbands. Here's what I would share with those women for seven days. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. If you're struggling in your marriage right now, love your husband. Just love him. What is he doing? Is he at the bar? Is he trying to pursue someone? Is he angry and frustrated? You just love him. You treat him the best you can because if Jesus came back in seven days, how many of you guys know if you knew the Lord was coming back in seven days, we'd get holier than thou suddenly, huh? We'd be like, he's coming back. We wouldn't worry. God doesn't want you to worry. Look up to heaven, pursue the word, allow the spirit to lead. And listen, this is the main thing we've said all weekend. I've got to boast in this church they're doing a six-week series, and yeah, they're using this book, but I can boast in, all this really is is doctrine. If you can sit in your marriage and say, I don't want to be in this, who God brings together, let no man separate, that will change your life. I'm going to be married to my wife, and we say this, we already said I do, but now we want to say we did. That is it. So God bless you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. And That's awesome. That's so good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's like Paul McCartney preaching with us. It's such a cool... <laughs> I love that. Um, I've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't until now. It, it's good. Um, um, but I believe first and foremost, he's called us to seek him and, and seek him in his word and mm -hmm. seek him in prayer. And so what I'm going to ask us as, as a church this week... Um, single, married, good marriage, not good marriage, that you would commit this week to immersing yourself uh, in the Word of God this week, and that you would commit this week to immersing yourself in prayer. And I don't want you to worry about the fact that you're single or that you're married or that your marriage is, is on the rocks or it needs a little tune-up or whatever. Focus on you, your heart, and your relationship with the Lord this week. Mm -hmm. Spend time with Him in the Word this week and allow that to encourage you and heal you and kind of redirect your, your thoughts. And that will, will be our commitment as a church this week. Next week, we're going to open up the church every single night for seven nights straight just for prayer. Wow. And if you're struggling with being single, you're struggling with uh, the, your marriage that's on the rocks, you're struggling just with finding uh, some hope or joy in a marriage that's kind of gone flat, then we'll be here every single night next week uh, just, just to minister to you. We're still not going to dive into counseling. We're going to talk to the counselor, capital C, first. Then after two weeks of that, then what we've got classes, then we've got counselors, then we've got all the tools that God has given us resources. This book right here, um, we, we are making available to every single one of you. If, if you're in a life group, uh, this is free to you. 30-day um, devotional for you to do with your spouse. I would encourage you, even if you're not married, do this. Because like Brian said, this is anchored in the scriptures. And so this is going to bless you in huge, huge ways. Um, it, it was such a nerve that was touched that last night, the 200 plus books that we had, um, all the Saturday night crew got them. We, we ran out. And so we will have enough for everybody um, next weekend, okay? But um, if there's probably 10, 20 left, if you're struggling, I mean, the wheels are coming off, then go talk to them in the life group soon and they can get you one this week. But dive into the word, dive into the word that's in this, this book. Does that sound like a plan to you? Um, I think it's a good place for us to be. I think it's a good place for us to be. Um, so the book is called Never Fails. And, um, and so if you need it quicker, I mean, you can always do the Amazon thing, but we will have them here for you next weekend.